Okay, what does our acronym GPELT stand for? Gills. What's P? Plasma membrane. Okay, what's E? What's L? And trachea. Trachea. All right, um, how many of these have you used? All of you have except lungs. You've used lungs, and then at one time in your development, you also just directly exchanged through your plasma membrane. When you were an itty bitty zygote, up until you developed lungs, you just diffused through there. Um, and until you were born, you used your mother's lungs vicariously, and then she exchanged through her blood to your blood. All right, so we only use two of these. Uh, frogs have a life cycle where they use more, okay? So a frog um, starts as a cluster of eggs in water. All right, how do eggs um, get their oxygen? Yeah, so through our plasma membrane. Okay, then they hatch into these uh, tadpoles. Okay, how do tadpoles get oxygen? Gills. Good. And then they go through a process where they um, transform from this larval stage to a juvenile stage. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to draw this very well. It's not bad. Okay, but he's he's still got a little tail. He hasn't lost it yet. Okay, now how does it breathe? Okay, lungs and skin. Right, so we're going to L and E. All right, and then it's going to grow up, become an adult, and lay eggs, or spray its sperm on some eggs. All right, so which one doesn't it use? Trachea, right? Why not? It has lungs, right, so it doesn't need to, right. What uses trachea? None of the uh, different types of organisms. What is, what's a, yeah, so insects will use uh, these basically cylindrical shafts in their body to kind of break off into this little network where air comes in and out. It is a diff, yeah, I mean, uh, trachea, it's, it's the same concept though. It's just this hollow pipe tube, yeah, which brings air into another space. But ours just brings it into the lungs. Okay, but yeah, one of them would be a trachea. And then this is the plural, trachea. Yeah. Okay. All right, what's this, what's this process called that was on, I think it was on the test? Yeah, so from going from your larva to a juvenile, we have a metamorphosis here. All right, I've got a list of animals here. I want you to tell me which of the G pelts they use, okay? Why don't you and your neighbor pick like two or three and go through them and do some research and figure out how do they get their gases? All right, who did spiders? What do spiders have? They should have some, well, some spiders actually have lungs. 
Yeah. Really? Most of them do, actually. So they have this. Um, it's a convergent. It's not the same um, evolutionary forces causing it, or it is the same evolutionary forces causing it. It's but it is a lung, similar to what we have, but structured a little bit different. It's called a book lung. All right, crabs, what do they have? Gills. 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 Well, then how do they go up on land and breathe? Yeah. yeah, it's all internalized, but it still has to have water in it, okay? So if a crab is left out of the water too long, it'll dry up and die. It has to go back to the water and wet its gills. All right, how about dragonflies? Yep. All right. Sea stars. Gills. All right. Aquatic salamanders. Gills. Okay. And they have external gills. So if you've ever seen little salamanders in the pond, they'll have these things sticking out of their neck. Those are the gills. All right. Redback salamanders. That's what we just looked at. Breathe through their skin. They don't have lungs. Okay, most terrestrial salamanders have lungs, but there is this group, it's called plethodont, uh, plethodont salamanders, which are not, which don't have lungs. All right, dolphins, okay. Good. Cube jelly. Yeah, just directly through its, uh, its cells. All right, and peripherans as well. And then a terrestrial s snail. Lungs and gills. Lungs and gills? Yes, that's what Wikipedia said. All right, one second. I, I actually don't know, so. <laughs> it says they're divided into two groups. There's some that use lungs and some that use gills. There you go. Some have lungs, some have gills. So if some spiders are lungs, are the rest of the spiders um, the tricky? Yeah. Um, but just for the purpose of this class, they all have lungs. <laughs> By my decree. Okay. All right. All right, hold your breath. We're going to talk about the uh, diving physiology a little bit. Um, but first, I want to have a hold your breath competition. Decompressing and compressing. Okay. So diving mammals, um, you know what they do to counteract this problem? They breathe out. Okay, so they don't take a deep breath before they dive. They actually get rid of all their air. So they don't have as much air going into their blood, and they don't have as much air coming out when they compress and decompress. When you're diving, you start to get the bends. You can't come up right away, right? That's when you'll dive. Right, so if you go incrementally, slowly up, then that gives you time to adjust as the, the um, air decompresses and you won't get the bins. Yeah, it's decompression stops. They like, used to have these tables that you mm -hmm. have, but now they have dive computers that do it all for you. So it tells you certain, at certain depths when to stop and take time. To right. So if you do scuba diving, this is a, this is a problem that you take care of. But, you know, the animals don't have this, right? So another thing that they will do, so they'll breathe out, they'll do uh, decompression dives. Okay, so what they'll do, if they have to go a super, super deep distance, they'll actually do a couple of dives kind of intermediate in distance, so their body's kind of used to that depth, and then they'll do a deep dive. They won't do a deep dive all at once. Um, Interesting. Okay, um, another thing they can do, so pressure also exerts force all over your body, um, and they have collapsible lungs. Okay, so their lungs are, have a lot of um, elastic tissue in them, so they will collapse with pressure, and then they'll reinflate as they resurface. So there's some of the things they can do with diving. All right, what's another challenge with diving? Okay, buoyancy. Um, and so that's another reason why they breathe out, right? If you're going to take this, 
your lungs full of air and try and go deep into the ocean, that's going to pull you up. So if you breathe out, that allows you to go. Not, you don't have to drag all that air with you. All right, what's another challenge then? Especially because you've breathed out all your air. Yeah. All right, you don't have, you have oxygen. no oxygen. All right. All right, so what, is it, what, is, what are the physiological responses for that? If you're going to be a diving animal, a diving mammal, what do you have to have? Okay, so you're going to have lots of hemoglobin in your lung, in your, um, sorry, in your blood. Lots. Lots. Uh, you're going to have an increased amount of red blood cells, which have lots of hemoglobin on them. Right. Yeah, so this is also true if you are at a high elevation. Uh, you'll have, because the air is thinner, so there's less air, so you'll need more oxygen. The way you compensate for that is by making more red blood cells, and having more hemoglobin. Okay, there's also this, um, a similar to hemoglobin, it's called myoglobin. Where is myoglobin found in? What do you think myo means? Your muscle, right? So your myoglobin takes the oxygen from your hemoglobin. So if you have lots of myoglobin, you can store oxygen in that myoglobin. Okay? And um, animals that have lots of, of myoglobin, their meat, their muscles are very dark red. Okay? So that's what the dark meat uh, is in like your turkey. It has more myoglobin in it. The white meat has less. Okay, um, so that, that's how you can store oxygen. All right, what is the chemical cue for, how do you know you need another, take another breath? Okay, your brain tells you you need to take a breath, but what's, what's the chemical cue in your blood, do you think? Okay, you would think it's oxygen, but it's actually buildup of CO2. that's telling your brain you need to take another breath. So if you want to hold your breath longer, you can do this technique called apnoistic breathing. Where you take a lot of breaths to release all the carbon dioxide out of your breath. So all you have to do is you just breathe heavily for like 10 seconds. And then you should be able to hold your breath longer. Okay? So, all right, a couple other things we're gonna go over. Countercurrent exchange. This is used in gills. Okay, and it's an efficient way of, of exchanging anything. So, different organisms use this for heat. We use this in our kidneys to pull um, solutes out of our urine. Um, but in the case of gills, they're using it to fully extract oxygen out of the water. Okay? A similar system could be used and actually is used in birds to pull all of the oxygen out of the air. But mammals, we don't have a countercurrent exchange system. We just have big lungs. And also, there's plenty of oxygen in the air. so. We don't need them. But there's not as much oxygen in the water, and so it necess necessitates this exchange system. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about, have we done countercurrent exchange before? Okay. I don't know if we did it in Bio 1 or not. We're going to look at a concurrent exchange system first. Okay, so let's say you had water and the gill capillaries, let's we'll put blood here, going in the same direction. 
So let's say well, I'm just going to make up a number. Water has 100 units of oxygen at the beginning and blood has zero units of oxygen. And they're going to run side by side in the same direction and they're going to uh, exchange oxygen. All right, which way is the oxygen going to go just through diffusion? Into the blood. So let's say 10 units go over here. Oops. So now we have 10 units over here and 90 over here. And still, because of the difference, we're going to have more diffusion going. Okay, so then this will be 80 and 20, uh, 70 and 30. Until when is this going to stop? All right. At 50-50, then there's the same amount in the water as there is in the blood, and it's just going to go back and forth in equilibrium there. Okay? So the best you can do in a concurrent exchange system is to get 50% of the, of the oxygen out of the water into the gills. But what if they went in opposite directions? Ooh. So if the blood is running opposite of the water and the blood starts at zero and the water starts at 100, as this side gains or loses oxygen, this side is gaining oxygen. I'm just, it doesn't really matter as long as they decrease here. But now, what's the maximum uh, amount that can occur in the blood? Almost 100, so we can just go to 99, right? Okay, and so now we don't reach equilibrium until we're at almost 100% of the oxygen being transferred from the water to the blood. So this is what happens in gills. The water runs one way through the gills, and the blood runs the opposite way through the gills, and it's able to exchange oxygen throughout that whole exchange. And this is something that occurs over and over in physiological systems. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Last thing, then we're done. All right. Um, there is a trade-off between the tracheal system and how big an insect can be. Okay. So if you have your grasshopper here, it's going to be a horrible picture. He's got three sections and six legs. And in a high oxygen environment, these tracheal systems can be smaller. Okay, so I drew a spherical Tracheae, okay, because it doesn't need as much time or as much um, surface area to exchange with the hemolymph because there's more oxygen in the air, so it's going to diffuse faster. Okay, but that that means that the insect. can devote more energy, more structure to size. 
So if you have an insect in a high oxygen environment, it can be bigger. But in a lower oxygen environment, the trachea are going to be larger. And it has to devote less to size. So the insect will be smaller because it, those tracheal systems are going to take up size and uh, take up the amount of structure devoted to it, and so it can't devote as much to it. Yeah? No, the amount of oxygen is the same <laughs> as it is here, as in there. It changes in elevation, so maybe insects across elevations would be smaller. But yeah. So what if you took like an insect that was evolved in a low oxygen environment and put it into a high oxygen environment? Would it like would it just perform better or like is there a kind of a point that it reaches a limit? There's still a limit, yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe it would be able to exercise faster and longer. But they've actually taken species, you know, individuals and raised them in higher oxygen environments as those tissues formed the tracheal systems have been smaller and the bodies have been bigger. Okay? Um, and this is...